but there is praise from others. Did you see that? It says, you have a reputation for being alive. Other people talk about them. That's what a reputation is. When other people, look at Glenn, he's so good looking. So that's, you know, I have a reputation of being so good looking, right? Other people talk about how good looking I am. No, I'm just kidding, right? But notice there's no praise from Jesus. But you are dead. Why should Christians be committed to the church? Jesus is. That, that's what we're going to see. What, what role should the church have? There's a lot of confusion and questions in the 21st century about the, the style of church and what role it should have and what it should emphasize. Well, it should have the role that Jesus gives it. It should emphasize the things that Jesus wants it to emphasize. What should the church, how should the church live in the world? We're going to see it, that we, it's to be conformed to his will and not the will of the world. What we're going to see in this chapter is it's just a searing picture of how deeply Jesus loves the church. He refuses to be indifferent. If you love something, you love something or you love someone, the last thing that you feel is indifferent about where they're at and what their situation is. You might hate what they do. Or you might love what they do. You won't be indifferent to them. And because Jesus is not indifferent to his church, that is, by the word church, I mean all his churches scattered throughout the world. Each local church is, a, is an expression of the heaven reality. The Bible says that that where spiritually Christians are gathered around Jesus. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, it says we're, we're raised up and spiritually we're gathered around Jesus. And that's what eternity will be, a gathering around who God is and through Jesus, the Lamb on the throne. But then each local church is kind of like a, it's, a, it's, it's an eschatological monster. <laughs> that is, it lives in the here and now on earth, looking forward to that future reality that will come. It's now, but not yet. Church lives here on earth as its full expression in heaven. It's now. We're living it out. But it's not yet what it will be, the redeemed community of God. That's what's on Jesus' mind. That's why he's not indifferent. He knows what the church ought to be and what it will be and where it's going. So he cannot leave it where it is. Because of his love, he will conform the church what it ought to be, or he'll end it. And so this raises some pretty big questions. Is there ever, ever a time to leave a church? Well, yes and no. <laughs> Should we work to transform the church to, to be according to church's will? Absolutely. Is there a time to say that this ch a church is dead and lost? Absolutely. So we're going to step in that with a similar pattern that we've kind of seen. We're going to look at these three churches, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Um, John's working his way. He's speaking to the churches in Asia, ancient Asia, which is on the eastern front of the Roman Empire. And he's working in a clockwise way, if you can see on that picture, around the churches. And we've done the first four, kind of coming up the coast and across, and then down and through to the bottom. Here's the pattern. As Jesus speaks to each church, there's a vision of Jesus. There's praise from Jesus. There's a rebuke from Jesus, there's a call to conquer, and then there's a wider message because each, each pattern, it finishes with this line, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So it's, it's written to the churches, but it's written to everyone listening in. You know when you get an email uh, and, and it's not really directed to you, but someone CCs you, which you know, stands for what, carbon copy? Um, that's what it used to stand for, you're carbon copied in, you're CC'd in. All of, you know, all Christians everywhere are cc'd in to this picture as Jesus speaks to his churches. Um, I'll just make a, another little brief comment. It'll come up again and again. Um, um, you heard in Oren's talk that he talked about the picture in Revelation is about the future. It's not quite right. It's, it's actually a picture of spiritual reality now. It's not just speaking about what events will unfold in the future. Some, yes. But it's actually talking about what we live in now. And it was speaking to the, the first century Christians as well. So it's kind of, it's to them and it's to us. It's not just future oriented. It's about living under Jesus now. 
All right. Sardis. What's Sardis like as a church? I don't want to be harsh, but I will be. They're spiritually dead. Spiritually dead Sardis. Um, the city was set on top of uh, three cliffs. Uh, you know, they weren't at the bottom of the cliffs, they were at the top of the cliffs, and they're basically impregnable. They were safe, they were secure, they were wealthy. Here's the vision of Jesus to Sardis. Verse 1, 3 1 Write to the angel of Sardis. Thus says the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Um, this is almost, almost like to the church of Ephesus. It's a picture of Jesus in his absolute rule over his church. You know, he's got the Holy Spirit of God. He's completely has the Spirit of God. He's utterly in God's presence. He's, he's divine, but he has the Spirit of God. But he has the seven stars. Well, what does Jesus say to praise Sardis? Nothing. There is no praise for Sardis. Verse 2, but there is praise from others. Did you see that? It says, you have a reputation for being alive. Other people talk about them. That's what a reputation is. When other people, look at Glenn, he's so good looking. So that's, you know, I have a reputation of being so good looking, right? Other people talk about how good looking I am. No, I'm just kidding, right? But notice there's no praise from Jesus. But you are dead. Think about the contrast there to Sardis. To many, it was a significant church. Maybe they called it a spiritual church. But for Jesus, who sees the heart, it's a zombie church. It looks alive. It does all the things that someone who's alive does. But actually, it's spiritually dead. Why? Well, it seems they've compromised. Verse 4. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes. The clothes are symbolic to say kind of how you stand in relation to society or culture, whether you wear the clothes of Jesus or the clothes of society. It's what you kind of put on. Do you robe yourself in the life of that city or do you robe yourself in Jesus? And it seems their clothes is defiled. They've compromised with the culture of the city. Its values were their values. So what does Jesus say to, to spiritually dead Sardis? Verse 2, repent, be alert and strengthen what remains, which is about to die. I have not found your works complete before my God. He says, you need to wake up to the fact that you're spiritually dead. You stand on the edge of a precipice. There's a tiny bit of life in you. You must strengthen it or it will be all over. And it seems there that it's their works that reveal the problem. Perhaps they're saying all the right things. But see, he says, I've not found your works complete before my God. They are all show and no go. They're all talk and no walk, which is ironic because they have a great reputation. There's a searing irony here. So what must they do? Well, actually, they're called back to the gospel. They're called back. There's, there's nothing complicated about the problem about the solution. Look at verse 3. Remember then what you have received and heard, keep it and repent. What is it they received? They received the great news about Jesus, his death for them for the sake of sin, his resurrection and his rule, his ascension to the right hand of God and the promise that he's coming again to judge the world. You heard it. You received it. Now keep it. It's not complicated. It seems that the reason they don't walk the talk and they're all show and no go is they've forgotten what they were taught. They've forgotten the heart and center of what it means to know Jesus and follow him. So Jesus warns them. In the next verse, if you are not alert, I will come like a thief. You have no idea at what hour I will come. In other words, he's saying, you've got to sort it out now. You know, when's a thief going to come? He doesn't send you a letter saying, oh, by the way, I'm going to rob your place tomorrow, get ready. He turns up when you're not ready. That's why it's so effective, right? And Jesus is saying, now the time is short. Sort it out now. I am coming. You don't know when. And when I come, it'll be too late. Can you imagine if you were a, if you were, if you were a Christian in this church, that you, you love Jesus and you were holding on to the gospel? It would be so hard, wouldn't it? You've got the culture of the city against you. But actually, you've got the culture of the church against you. 
you'd be asking yourself, wouldn't you be asking yourself, this is so costly. Is it, is it worth it? Am I right? I mean, all the other Christians here, people call themselves Christians are living like this. Maybe I should just conform to them. Maybe I should just capitulate. It's interesting, isn't it? At the time, probably in the city of Sardis, city of, I'm guessing, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 people, there was probably just one church. The, Christ, the Christian had no choice, really. They couldn't just, you know, wander on down to the ancient Presbyterians or, you know, try out the ancient Anglicans. Well, that's still, anyway, moving on. You know, you couldn't just go and check out the Pentecostals. Um, so they had to stay. We're in a different situation, aren't we? But it's clear here, there might, I think the implications are clear that there might be churches that have walked away from Jesus. They've got a good reputation. They, they look like they're doing well, but actually they've let go of the gospel. It might be right to leave. But what's wonderful here is actually Jesus is able to save his people before he sees them. Verse 4. But you have a few people inside us who have not defiled their clothes and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. And then comes the call to conquer. 3 verse 5 and 6. In the same way, the one who conquers will be dressed in white clothes and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and before his angels. Three beautiful things that Jesus kind of picks up onto those who are still holding on to him. One, you'll walk with Jesus in white. Verse 4. And you'll be dressed and robed in white. What's the white about? It stands for the purity that you have before God because of Jesus. His death for you has washed you clean from every sin, every past sin, every present sin, and every future sin. His death covers your whole life. You're washed clean. So those who hold on to Jesus will walk with him in white. They'll be dressed in white. And then verse 5 is powerful. He will acknowledge them before the Father. It says, just as you acknowledge me before the creator of all the universe, I will acknowledge you and say, this is my son. This is my daughter. They are worthy of eternal life. It's interesting there, the acknowledgement. There is no such thing as private Christianity. <laughs> That's the other thing it touches on. In, Ma in Matthew 10, 32, Jesus warns. He says, if you follow me, what's that look like? You have to confess me before others. And if you deny me before others, I will deny you. That's challenging, isn't it? There's no such thing as kind of private Christianity. It, ha it has to be public. That doesn't mean you have to necessarily stand on the street corner and yell, I'm a Christian. <laughs> but it does mean that when people ask you what matters to you, what's important to you, that's, that's the opportunity. It does mean you have to be open about, I go to church on Sunday, on the weekend. I, what did you do on the weekend? I went along to church. It was great. I went along to church. It was really boring. It was a really dull talk, but the songs were great. I went along to church. It was really great to think about this. It's ironic, isn't it? Sardis has a great reputation but not with Jesus. It's a zombie church. They look alive, but they're dead. What are some of the implications for Risen Church? Well, I love being part of Risen Church. I, I think it's, we're a great church family growing together. I, it's been wonderful to see people become Christians and growing in Jesus. Such an exciting part of Risen Church. But there's a warning to us here, isn't there? It's not what we think of ourselves that matters. And it's not what other people Think about us what, that is what matters, is it? It's what Jesus thinks about us. That's what matters. How are we going? Have we compromised? Have we committed, shaped ourselves according to the culture? Are we living out our convictions of the gospel? Are we holding on to Jesus? Are we spiritually alive? They're important questions. It's not what we think. It's not what the world thinks. It's what Jesus thinks. I'd like to invite someone up to lead us in prayer. Anyone? I can, but anyone else feel led?
All right? Well, I will. Weak, but winning in Jesus. Uh, this, it's another frontier city on the eastern edge of the empire. Uh, and they were economically weak. Um, the two reasons. One, they had const, fairly constant earthquakes and tremors. And that meant they had to kind of keep leaving the city for safety and coming back and rebuilding it. There's a real sense of impermanence for them. Um, the other thing that made them economically weak is the, the region was great for growing vines, but they weren't allowed to, to make wine um, because the Roman Empire was running out of corn. Too many people were planting wine because there was better money in wine and there was starvation happening in the Roman Empire. So the emperor had given an edict that you have to plant corn or grain, but that actually didn't grow very well in this region. So they were kind of economically weak from that as well. Well, what's the vision of Jesus here? Verse 7, write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, thus says the Holy One, the True One, the One who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. Uh, the key of David, it's a reference to Jesus' messianic rule. He's come as the promised Messiah, fulfilling the promise in 2 Samuel 7, that one day a son of David would rule on the throne forever. And the Jews at the time thought that the Messiah would come and just rule from Jerusalem. And, you know, in a sense, the Jews' nation would expand. But the picture of Jesus is greater than that. It's actually about his messianic rule in the heavens, his spiritual rule over all people. So the key represents power there, the key of David to open and close. If what he opens, no one will close. And what he closes, no one can open. I don't know uh, if you grew up on a farm, whether you ever had this experience. I grew up on a farm and we had gates that only my father could open. Uh, yeah, I see a few ex-farm people nodding. There were some gates in our farm. Either you just didn't have the strength to open them or they were so dangerous. So those panel fences with a steel bar that used to lock them in place. And you had to kind of lift the steel bar and it would fling back and you nearly died in the process. You know, this was the unopenable gate. Dad would say, could you go and move the sheep? And you'd be like, Dad, is that where the gate's on the second panel? And he's like, yeah, that's the one. So then sometimes I remember once with me and um, two of my, my younger brother and sister, all three of us leaning on this pole to kind of lift it, to kind of get it out of the way so the gate would open. When it comes to the spiritual role, only Jesus opens and closes the doors and gates. Well, Philadelphia, they are weak, but winning. Verse 8, I know your works. Look, I have placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power. Isn't that really interesting? Because they have but little power, Jesus himself has placed before them an open door for ministry. It's, it's ironic. You'd think if they were powerful, Jesus would place before them an open door for ministry. But Jesus says, actually, because you have little power, I've opened up a door for your ministry. Isn't that interesting? Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? I take it. It's because they'll do ministry rightly. It's because they won't depend on themselves, but will depend on Jesus. He opens up opportunities for them to take the gospel where it otherwise wouldn't go. But he does this in the midst of a very difficult situation. He praises them and he offers them protection. He offers them protection. Verse 9, note this. I'll make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and who are not, but are lying. So what's going on here? It seems like, again, the Jews who had the right to worship, to, to not bow down and do the emperor worship, and they, they had the protection, they didn't have to bow down to the local deities, um, uh, were, were either, you know, maybe the Christians were meeting in the, in the Jewish building, maybe they were saying, yes, we have the same identity of the Jews, but the Jews were pushing them out, or perhaps reporting them out of bitterness or anger, and perhaps even that the Christians were begging the Jews to not report them. But they still were. And so Jesus says, though they're a Jewish synagogue, they're not my people. They're a synagogue of Satan. 
So what will Jesus do? It'll be a great reversal. Verse 9, I will make them, the Jewish people, come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you. They think they are the people of God, but they will see that the Messiah, the Davidic Messiah, loves the Christians here in Philadelphia. And actually the Jews will bow down at the feet of the Christians. So perhaps the Christians were bowing down and pleading, and it's just this great reversal. But this is really just a little, little thing, and aside there, it's great to love Jesus, right? That's, it's really terrific to love Jesus. But there's something even better in this verse, to be loved by Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? They will know that I have loved you. And, it, and at, at judgment, it will be displayed who it is that Jesus has loved. And Jesus promises to protect his people. Verse 10, because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that's going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Their faithfulness to Jesus means Jesus' protection. He knows they're weak. He knows they're vulnerable. They're doing their best. So actually, he's not going to put a burden on them that will break them. In his love, he sees their weakness and vulnerability. So actually, though a whole test is going to come on on the whole world, not quite what that, sure what that means, um, or that it's just a kind of region around them, but it's a metaphor or a symbol. But Jesus says, you won't be tested. And is, is there a call to repent? No, there's no call to repent. They're doing really well. Really interesting, isn't it? In their weakness and struggle, it seems like they're deeply dependent on Jesus, holding on to the gospel with clarity and vigor, so there's opportunity to minister, there's protection from Jesus, and there's nothing they need to repent of. And there's this beautiful picture at the end, two, two really pictures of, of, of the wider message. Verse 12, the one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never go out again. That's, it's, a re- it's a really evocative image. In, in an ancient building, you know, the, how they held up, massive, you know, if you walk through a cathedral, old cathedrals, massive pillars held up the building, permanent, unshakable. They were, they were kind of central to what was happening in the middle of the building. And so in a city that's rocked by earthquakes, people had to constantly leave, come back, and unstable and vulnerable. Jesus offers this picture and says, actually, you will be a pillar in the presence of God. Through me, you will be permanent and protected. You'll be unshakable and unassailable in the presence of God. What a beautiful picture. And then following on, he says, verse 12, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, who comes out of heaven from my God and my new name. So there's kind of a Trinitarian naming there. Jesus says, you know, forever you'll be known as mine. You'll have the name of my God, Yahweh. You'll have the name of the, name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. Perhaps it's it's a picture of the Holy Spirit, I think, from Ephesians 2.22. And you'll have my name, the name of Jesus himself, my new name. What's he saying? Don't, don't, Don't waver. Keep holding on to the gospel. Keep waiting. The pathetic will be protected. The weak will win. Why? Because he has already won. What are the implications for us at Risen Church? Well, Some of us are doing it tough, really tough. Some of us are tired and exhausted, nothing left to give, perhaps physically, perhaps spiritually. And perhaps we look at the the weakness of our faith, the weakness of our trust in Jesus, and we think, is it enough? Is it enough? The answer is yes, it is. Because what matters here is not how strong your trust is, but the strength of the one you trust in. And who is the one you're trusting in? If you put your trust in Jesus, all power is his. He opened and closes eternal life. He determines eternity in the hearts of people. You cannot have more power than that. You cannot have a greater act in the world than to affect someone and say, this person now will be an eternal being who will never end in the presence of God. Think about that. Think of all the changes we bring to the the world around us, the buildings we build that will soon crumble, the the careers we work on that will soon end, the lives, the bodies we build up and we make them buff, but soon they'll burn out and fade away. 
All our change is impermanent. But Jesus' power is seen in his permanence. He opens and closes eternity. So if you're weak or struggling, Jesus has got you. You might feel weak, but you will win because he has already won. Romans 8, verse 38, Paul writes this, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can break you from the power of Jesus' love for you. Nothing can separate you. All we need to do is keep holding on to him. You might feel weak, but in him and because of him, you will win. But he has already won. Someone like to come and lead us in prayer? Any volunteer? Matt, beautiful. Thank you. All right, shout him out. What options did you come up with? Stand for nothing, Laodicea. Yep. Yeah. Ooh, lackluster Laodicea. Not bad. I'll pay that. Room temperature, Laodicea. Yeah. Tepid and timid, Laodicea. Yeah. All right. I went with lukewarm Laodicea. Lukewarm Laodicea. All right, let me read it out for us. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness the originator of God's creation. I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were cold or hot, that because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. But you say I am rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I advise you, to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, and ointment to spread on your eyes so you may see. As many as I love, I, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he will be with me. To the one who conquers, I'll give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who's ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the church. Lukewarm Laodicea. Um, they were a wealthy, a very wealthy city. And it came from three things that will come up a little bit later. From their banking, um, they had a medical center that was famous for eye ointment, and they were a famous clothing center. They produce these beautiful black robes and just everyone wanted one. So what's the vision of Jesus? Verse 14, write to the angel of the church in Laodicea, thus says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. It's kind of like, it's, it's a little bit saying Jesus, the beginning, the originator of God's creation, but also the Amen, the end. He's like the let it be so. He's the one who closes the deal, seals the deal, brings about reality. And he's the true and faithful witness to all God's plans in the now but not yet. Kind of picturing the kind of whole scope there. And I probably did them in the wrong order. <laughs> praise. What's the praise for Laodicea? How does Jesus praise Laodicea? Yeah. Elaine shaking her head. There is none. None at all. Well, it's not quite true. There's no praise from Jesus, but there's deluded self-praise. Verse 17, for you say, I'm rich. I've become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. See, the very fact that they are self-deluded about their spiritual condition means they're not looking to praise from Jesus. Well, what's the rebuke? 
Well, it's <laughs> like it's it's big, isn't it? Right? Jesus is not mucking around. Verse fifteen: I know your works. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. What? What does that mean? What does it mean? I take it it means they were they are utterly indifferent to the gospel that saved them. They're comfortable, content, cozy, and complacent. They're, they're, they're not hot, they're not living for the gospel, but they're not cold. They're not even choosing other spiritual systems and other ways to live. It's not like some of the other churches where they're kind of leaning into false teaching and kind of leaning away. They're just utterly indifferent. I think they're Australians. Really, I think they're Australians. Spiritually apathetic. So Jesus warns them, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. It's a revolting picture. Um, where does it come from? Apparently, there was a spring not far from the city of Laodicea, and it ran down to the city or into the city or near it, and it was lukewarm, it was tepid, and it was full of mineral salts. It just tasted revolting, and you couldn't, you kind of, everyone who went to the city was like, oh, look, a natural spring, I'm going to get me some of that. Blah! What's it like? Well, there's really visual picture here, right? Jesus is going to vomit them up. It's trying to actually kind of emotionally, you know, it's talking about um, in the first week of Revelation, it's kind of giving, trying to give us big, powerful visual images to stick with us. It is actually showing Jesus grief and sadness at spiritual apathy among his people. That he, he, he in a sense, is revolted by it just as you would be revolted. You know, the thing you vomit out of your mouth is the thing that you're revolted by. I don't know, think yogurt. It's been sitting out in the balcony for a couple of days in the Queensland sun. Or think, you know when you've ever had like a soup, and it's a soup that's like, when it's hot, it's really good, but then if it kind of goes cold, or it's been a couple of days, the fat congeals on it, and it just kind of clings to everything, and you put it in your mouth, and all you can feel is, oh, you just feel fat. It's just like, whoa. little visual, isn't it? <laughs> but I wanted to kind of help you catch the emotional power of this. Jesus is revolted by their indifference. And they are indifferent because they are deluded about their spiritual condition. Jesus is saying well, to this church, you know, you've got to, you've got to turn around. Let me just kind of, we're going to touch on this a little bit at the end, but look, honestly, is, we don't like to, you know, you know, 30, 40 years ago in Australia, it was kind of like this church is a good church and that church is a bad church and churches like, don't go to there. And, but now we're really cautious about bagging out other churches, right? And that, that's a really good thing about that. Um, I think there's a lot more gospel generosity between churches um, and recognize that, you know, we're, if we're on the same page about Jesus and the Bible, then other differences don't really matter that much. I think that's great. But does that mean that every church is a good church to go to? This picture says absolutely not. There is a time to leave a church. But this also is kind of powerful. How do we pick a church? Often people pick a church because it feels right to me. But that's a bit risky, isn't it? Because if you're tepid spiritually, then what's going to feel right for you? Something that's tepid. If you're spiritually hot, then it's right. Great, a spiritually hot church will feel good. If you're spiritually cold, probably a spiritually cold church will feel good for you. That's actually a dangerous criteria. Pick a church that feels right for me. The question is, what's the, what's the church that matters to Jesus? What does Jesus want from his church? What does Jesus want from me? And for that, we have to go back to the scriptures. So they're indifferent. The lukewarm Laodiceans, the lackluster Laodiceans, I like that. Jesus wants them to come to him. He calls them to come to him in verse 18. He says three things that pick up the city. He says, buy from me gold refined in fire. Get from me high quality wealth. None of this earthly trash. Get from me white clothes. Be dressed and not naked. And get ointment so you can see. So he's picking up on those three things from the city, their banking, their medical um, kind of ointment, and also their clothing industry. He says, you 
think you're rich, but you're spiritually desperate. You think you're beautifully attired because you're wearing, what, an Armani suit, but you're spiritually naked and ashamed like Adam and Eve. And they'd suddenly discovered they'd rebelled against God in the garden and they were naked and ashamed. And they think they see things clearly. They are spiritually blind. But Jesus loves them. And he rebukes them because he loves them. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. He's actually saying, I'm being so harsh with you because I love you. I want you to be with me. He says, I'm saying these harsh things to you because I love you. So then don't back away from me. Be zealous and repent. And then there's this powerful invitation. It often gets used evangelistically. Um, uh, in, it used to get used a lot in evangelistic talks, but it's Jesus actually speaking to people who call themselves already Christians. Verse 20. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Jesus is banging on the door of a church <laughs> saying, you don't have me. Bang, let me in. I want to be with you. You don't realize that you don't have me. And what's he offering? What's at stake? The greatest party you've ever known. That's what the image there he says, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. It's a sign of, of fellowship that Jesus ate with people and it's the kind of there's no gap between us. We, we share food. We break bread together. But it also picks up in the Old Testament passage in Isaiah 24 or 25 where God says, one day I will come and there will be the greatest banquet, the finest of wines, the most luscious Wagyu steak you've ever had cooked to perfection. The most beautiful kind of Asian food or Thai food you've ever desired. What will that feast be? It will be the day when death is overthrown and the new creation is ushered in. And it's kind of getting that visual picture of the greatness of food and banquets and fellowship and saying that's just a glimpse of what eternity will be like. Jesus banging at the door and saying, I want to bring the party. You think you've got a party, but I've got the party. Let me in. And even in lukewarm Laodicea, if anyone opens the door, Jesus will come to be with them. Isn't that wonderful? Even though they've walked away from him, even though they're spiritually indifferent, he wants to be with them. He wants to fix the problem. He wants them to repent. He wants them to know him. All I've got to do is say, yes, Jesus. Let me just speak to you briefly on that. If, that, if that's you, if you're spiritually indifferent, the way to fix that is, is really just to say to Jesus, Jesus, change it. <laughs> Come to me. Change me. Transform me. Help me be all in with you. Make yourself known to me. And I tell you, that is absolutely a prayer that Jesus will answer. Cry out to him and say, Jesus, I want to open my heart and my life up to you. I want you to change. I want you to transform me. I want to be one of your people. I want you to use me. And he will. And with it, he'll give you eternity. Look at this beautiful picture in 321. To the one who conquers, I'll give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I have conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Says, do, you want to, do you want to live for the petty wealth of today? Or do you want to sit on the throne in eternity that Jesus rules on? Do you want to be a son or daughter of God in the new creation, ruling the new creation because you're made in the image of God and being conformed to Jesus, the great ruler? What are you going to live for? <laughs> Going to live for, you know, takeaway pizza and career and a house on the coast that'll soon be washed away with climate change. We're going to live for an eternal throne. It will never perish or fade. All right. See, Jesus loves his church. 
Here's just a little summary. It's also in the outline. Is it a bit hard to see? It's too small. It, yeah, it's a bit small. Basically, a little summary. Um, it's in the outline, the Google outline, if you kind of chase it down. What do you see here? Well, you see Jesus loves his church, but it's his church. We don't get to define the truth taught at his church. He does. We don't get to define how we live as part of his church. He does. We don't get to define what loving service looks like even. It's his church. He does. So notice here in this little chart, if you can see, I've got none there. Um, only two churches are not rebuked. Five churches have got things to sort out. If, if seven is a kind of symbolic number of perfection, if you visit seven churches in Brisbane, five of the seven will have significant issues. Two of them probably shouldn't exist and are spiritually dead, at least, if not three. But ironically here, two of the best churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, that are not rebuked at all, are the ones that are weakest and look least impressive. But they've got Jesus. Jesus is judge and saviour. He will judge false teaching and those who follow it. But he will save those who are his. And Jesus expects his churches to be wholeheartedly his churches. Half-hearted and half-minded churches are not acceptable to him. He doesn't, but he doesn't push them away. He calls them to be transformed. He calls them to live out who they actually are if they've come to him. He calls them to be conformed to him not the culture of the world and the culture of the city. But the other thing we see is that Jesus ends churches. He warns he'll unmake Ephesus and vomit up Laodicea unless they repent. He's kind and compassionate. There's opportunity to repent. His judgment doesn't fall immediately. The warning has an immediacy. He wants change now. He calls on them to repent. He gives them opportunity to repent. But he will end the church if he needs to because he loves it too much. And he loves the purpose of the church too much. Revelation 1, what's the purpose of the church? He calls people to be a kingdom of priests. The role of the church is to bring glory to God by representing God to the world. Jesus won't continue to let his church fail. He'd rather end it for the sake of the gospel. Why should we be committed to the church? Why should you be committed to Risen Church if you're starting to call Risen Church your home? Because Jesus loves the church. So we must love the church. What's our role in the church? I just touched on it. To be a kingdom of priests. Serving him. Serving him in the world. Not of the world. Not conforming to the world. Conforming to Jesus, but taking his message to the world. And how should Risen Church live? Well, just like that. Conform to his will and not the will of the culture around us.